All right. As I said, we're going to review gluttony today, consider Plutus and Fortune, observe anger, reach this, and meet the heretics. Probably we're going to do four and five tomorrow, or rather Thursday. Uh, this is lecture six, canto six to nine, upper hell, part two. So, a couple things I want you to remember from here are nothing. Uh, I want to move straight on to this, this slide. Okay, good. So, as you know, we've already gotten through the first two circles of the Inferno. The first circle with an asterisk limbo, the, which involves those people who were unbaptized or were pre-Christian pagans. The second circle was the circle of lust. We there very famously met Francesca da Romini, uh, as well as her lover Paolo. We saw there Mark Antony, Cleopatra, Achilleus, uh, Tristan, and Assault, uh, as well as a couple of more people who are popping out of my head at this particular moment. Then we move on to Canto 6, Circle 3, Gluttony. At the entrance to this circle, as we so often see amongst uh, the circles in the Inferno, we find a Greco-Roman demon, essentially. Uh, the reason why these creatures were once gods or monsters is that in the Greco-Roman religion, they had less of a, a focus on good and evil and more on a differential in power. So... The difference between Zeus and a regular person might not be that Zeus is more moral than a regular person, but that he's far more powerful. Well, once the Christian tradition came about, the Greco-Roman monsters and gods would become what would later be called demons. Which is interesting because the word demon comes from the Greek word daimonia, which means sort of like spirits between uh, Olympians, uh, which are called theoi, and uh, humans. Uh, a nymph would be a daimonia. In any case, let me describe this circle of gluttony for you, just so that you have a more visceral, more physical idea of what it's like. While Dante and Virgil are walking through, they are walking on supine forms, people lying on the ground, in the mud, trying to get over them and around them while freezing rain and hail hits them. It's a very un-what situation. It's uncomfortable. It's, uh, ah, you got to get through it. Oh, and then Cerberus is growling, and the people are moaning. It's just, you're starting to get an idea that hell is a very physical place for Dante. It's a place of anguish. It's a place of hearing anguish moans. Ah, 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 annoying sounds. And annoying rain, too. You don't have any peace, and people are stepping on you, and you're covered in mud, and you feel very dirty, and that is the appropriate way to look at Dante's Inferno. It is very much a place where you can never feel satisfied, where you can never feel dry, clean, good, healthy, uh, probably how you feel now. In fact, uh, uh, you would probably feel okay at feeling bored in his hell, just because it does seem to be a place of active anguish almost constantly. In any case, keep in mind that part of the punishment of the gluttons is that they are being ravaged, ravished, really ravaged, by and consumed, bit, bitten, by Cerberus constantly. So just as they overconsume, so is their flesh being consumed during the course of their punishment, which makes quite a bit of sense. Does anybody recall, I don't expect you to know this term quite yet, but do any of you remember the Italian term for to suffer the opposite, which indicates the symbolic relationship between sin and punishment? Anybody remember it or just want to try it? I'll put it up on the screen in a second. Remember this term, contrapasso in the red there. Contrapasso. It means suffer the opposite. I'll leave it up there for five seconds, then we got to move on because we have a very long lecture today. And so the contrapasso of this particular uh, of this particular circle, and that's one of the intellectual exercises of Dante. You can always be thinking about a new contrapasso for each of these circles. It's not necessarily fixed, though there are common traditional opinions. So one of them here is just as in life. These sinners were consumed by their desire for food and drink, so are they consumed in death. Okay, okay, I want you to pause for reflection for one moment. I want to say one thing just to, to decrease the depth of this class for a moment. So we've been looking at the punishments as if these people lived their lives, had lives that they enjoyed, and then made it to the inferno, right? And now they're getting punished. Is that what it's like? That's kind of how we've been assuming it is, right? I want to suggest a different way to look at the inferno. For you. These people who are being punished by our account have gotten exactly what they always wanted in their lives. I want you to really think about that. Each sinner in the inferno has exactly what he or she wants. Think of Francesca. 
What is it that she doesn't want to take for her actions? Responsibility. Responsibility. Well, now she's not even responsible for how her body moves. Flitting about like a leaf in the wind constantly, just in life. Well, someone who overeats or drinks doesn't want to take responsibility for his or her body and what happens to it. Well, do these gluttons have to take responsibility for their bodies now? No, they're eaten and dealt with by Cerberus. All of these people wanted to give up control and therefore responsibility. Have they all gotten their wish? Yes. They have. They have. And I just wanted to share that with you. Because I think that's an important thing to keep in mind. These people aren't being punished by getting what they didn't want. Their punishment is to get precisely what they did want. All right. Good. Good, good, good. Oh, and I make a modern connection. Have any of you ever seen... The first Harry Potter, Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone, or read it before, show of hands. Okay, well, if you ever do, you'll recognize that there's a creature based on Cerberus there. In Hogwarts, which is a magical school in Harry Potter, so if you ever see this, I do recommend that you see Harry Potter, by the way. I think it's, it's good stuff, especially for young people. Uh, you'll find that there is a secret passageway guarded by a three-headed dog named Fluffy. What is Fluffy? Which creature is Fluffy based on from the Greco-Roman mythology? Yes? Cerberus, very good, very good. So there, there you, can, uh, you can annoy the people around you by telling them something that potentially they know, potentially they don't know. In any case, let's remember Shiako. Now, Shiako is a man who was apparently rather amorphous or corpulent. That means he was, he was rather up there in weight. He was, he was overweight, very much overweight, extremely overweight. He talks a little bit about memory, which I think is sort of a funny thing for him to do because it's like he's full of memories in the same way that he's uh, full of food as well. Um, and he brings up a very important division that we're going to see uh, recapped over and over during the course of this uh, class, which is the division between the, the Florentine Guelphs and the Florentine Ghibellines. And in fact, when we get to heresy on Thursday, one of the characters will be a Ghibelline captain named Farinata Deli Uberti. And he will talk... He, uh, he will talk quite a bit about two major battles that the Guelphs lost to the Ghibellines. And Dante will, will respond that at least the Guelphs came back unlike the Ghibellines last time they were expelled. Um, but those two events will have happened in 1248 and at Monteperti in 1260. In any case, Dante then asks this Siaco about several leading citizens from Florence. The greatest souls from Florence. And unfortunately, it seems as if Dante's judgment is defective in some way. Defective because these four leading souls that he asks about are described as Chiaco as the blackest souls in hell. And in fact, we'll see them in Cantos 10, 16, and 28. Who are they? They are. Farinata degli Uberti, who I just mentioned, who we'll see in Canto 10, in Circle 6, amongst the heretics. He'll actually be in a flaming tomb, co-occupying with a Guelph, uh, named Cavalcanti di Cavalcanti, though supposedly they do not know that each, uh, they do not recognize each other's existence. Sort of like how the Ghibellines and the Guelphs try not to acknowledge each other's necessary existence. Like a side of a coin wishing not to recognize the other side. We'll talk about that more when we get to the uh, angry and the uh, sullen. We're going to see two of these characters, Tagayo Aldebrandi and Jacopo Rusticucci, uh, in the same circle. They're going to form an infernal trinity. An infernal trinity being a set of three that is in some way in a, a corruption of the actual Catholic Trinity. In fact, you may have already noticed a couple of those. Have we, in the last canto, seen something that is three but one, which consumes eternally rather than giving eternally? Opposite from the Catholic idea of the Trinity. Anything amongst the gladness? Yes? Cerberus, who's literally described as a great worm. A, a worm, like a snake, is a giant what, essentially? It's got a mouth, and then a, heart, a huge what? Stomach. It's all about consumption. It's all consuming, like the idea of sin here, rather than all giving. Which is interesting, because you see a difference there between being a physical being and being an intellectual being. Because the more you know, the more you can give. Because when you give that which is intellectual, do you lose it? Like, if I teach you how to do math, do I know less math at the end of that? No, but you know more. And so, to give someone information is to increase the store of something that 
uh, never decreases. In fact, you might be like, hey, is that the story uh, about the Sermon on the Mount and giving like some fish and some bread to people and it seems like not enough but it's more? I'd say that is a very strong way to interpret that sort of thing if you are into allegorical interpretations. In any case, the last soul on this list is Mosca. We will see him amongst the schismatics. To be schismatic means that you try and divide people. You are, in the parlance of contemporary hip-hop, trifling. In fact, we'll see uh, a couple folks there. Dante obviously was not very positive towards the Muslim faith, given the fact that he existed during the time of the Crusades, nine of which happened uh, before he existed mostly. Um, he'll, he'll actually have the progenitor of the Muslim faith, whose name is Muhammad, uh, have his face cut by a demon every single uh, day, as well as his uh, son-in-law, Ali, will be cut from neck down to midriff each day. And it's kind of hard to keep your viscera, your guts, your organs inside of you if you're cut open. Um, but Musk is apparently a pretty bad dude, and you might expect that he sows discord amongst forms. Something that has always been considered a bad thing to do is to split families apart, to split religions apart, to split political parties apart. And you might say, Mr. Schmidt, uh, can you think of uh, divisions that have happened within uh, even Christianity? I would say, well, yeah, students. Um, you do know that even by Dante's time, there was a Western church and an Eastern church that would later become Russian Orthodox slash Greek Orthodox, and the Western church would become Roman Catholicism. And then later, a couple centuries after Dante, there's a further split in the Western church between Protestants and Catholics. And so, one thing that Dante is trying to convey to you, which I am also trying to convey to you, is that people are always coming, about, coming together, but also what? Splitting apart. Right. Right. Very much so. Very much so. And I, I think I'll show you a very sad poem about... Dante had a best friend named Guido Cavalcanti, who we'll talk more about in Canto 10. And he actually wrote a poem to Guido. And this is probably something you've said to one of your friends if you've lived a pretty good life, which is... You know, you're, I love you so much, and I love our relationship so much that I hope things never change. I wish we could be sent to a land where things would never change. Maybe you've had that sort of thought before. Well, what's very sad about Guido Cavalcante and Dante is that they do grow apart, and eventually Dante is actually one of the people who exiles Guido, and then he dies the very same year from malaria. And so their childish wish never to grow apart and be apart, was it fulfilled? No. No, and so, the, even though this is a comedy, there are very much tragic elements to it. And even though perhaps life is a comedy, there are very much tragic elements to it. Alright, um, I don't need you to write this. I need you to write these bold words here. I need you to remember the four ways to interpret Dante's The Divine Comedy. The first one's not written up there, I'll say it to you. It's the literal way. The literal way is what is actually, literally happening in this text. Dante is going on a journey through the underworld, all the actual facts. That's the way that I expect you all to be able to read. Now, there are three additional ways, uh, one of which especially we will be drawing from, which I've mentioned before, which is uh, there's the allegorical way, that's the symbolic way to read this. The anagogical way, uh, the way to, uh, with, which is described as the way to free the soul from slavery and to make it free. I might update that to today to the way to lead your mind from slavery to freedom, so that you can think freely for yourself. But maybe that update isn't appropriate, but I think it is. And then there's, of course, the moral way to read this. Actual advice for not falling into traps in life. And I would say, that's very useful. I will occasionally suggest moral advice, though, uh, you know, how you live is up to whom? You. It's up to you. It's up to you. Very good. Okay, and so... While, uh, and I don't want to lose your interest while I say this, so I'm going to say this fairly, fairly quickly. While Shiaka is speaking, there are several ways to read uh, and interpret his ideas on memory. So let's take a look at it. How does the divine comedy relate to memory? Well, the allegorical way to read it is, the divine comedy is a giant encyclopedia full of all the examples from literature, philosophy, and history of people who acted right, they go to Paradiso, and those who acted wrong, they go to Inferno. Why would that be useful? Yes. Because you can learn from their mistakes. Because if countless people have made mistakes with loss, and it has led countless times to problems, what do you probably know about you? 
If you give in to lust, will you likely run into the same problems? Right. So do you have to run into the same problems in order to know what they might be? No. It's like science it, or the process of science. If somebody's already failed in an experiment a thousand times, you don't need to replicate those failures. You can just replicate the success. Well, the anagogical reading is do not fall into the traps of these sins because you will enter your soul into eternal bondage. Which is interesting because that does seem to neurologically be sort of true. The habits that you make are what you become. So if you start bad habits when you're young, you become a person full of what? Bad habits, wasps and hornets. And you leading, you're leading, you know, really setting yourself up to live a life of frustration. Doesn't sound that wrong. And then, of course, a moral way of looking at things. Don't be led to perdition. Or off the way of moderation by the attraction of food or anything that leads you away from moderation. Because the more you are excessive in your desires, or the more you are deficient, the less moderate you are. And moderation is apparently what leads somebody towards success in this world, according to Dante and Aristotle. Well, those are the four ways to read. I will be quizzing you on that very soon, so make sure you get that. Okay. This is a huge slide. So what I want you to write are the, the words that I have colored here for you. I've been using these words, sin and vice, fairly carelessly. But Dante does observe a difference between them. I want you to know not only what the three characteristic sins of the Florentines are, Again, those three, those infernal three. And also I need you to know the difference between sin and vice by tomorrow. Here are the three sins of the Florentines, and they're pretty bad. Pride, envy, and avarice. In Latin, if you want to know what they are, they're superbia, invidia, and avaritia. These are, um, well, pride and envy, when we get to the purgatorio, you'll soon see... The purgatorio is built on the seven deadly vices. Sometimes they're called sins, but that's, uh, that's inaccurate, actually. They are technically vices. Envy and pride are the very worst. You might ask me why, and I'll say, we're really going to focus that, on that in the purgatorio, but here's the reason why. Vices are the mental dispositions which lead to the specific sinful acts. I'll say that again. Vices are the mental dispositions which lead to specifically sinful acts. So one thing I'll say is this. The purgatorio is seven levels high. It's based on the seven deadly vices. You've heard them called the seven deadly sins, but that is inaccurate. Since vice is a mental disposition, it leads to sin. In order to get rid of a sinful action, therefore, is it most useful to just change how you behave or to change your attitude so that you behave differently? Think even how we talk. Has anybody ever heard about somebody trying to get an attitude adjustment? <laughs> Bless you. Have you ever heard about getting your head on straight? What do these expressions mean? To have to have an attitude adjustment. To get your head on straight. What change are you making? And what is it you're changing in yourself when you do this? You're changing your mind, right? Because your actions and your behaviors come from your what? Your thoughts. And your thoughts come from your general attitude. So if you're, say, resentful and angry about things, you're probably going to act like a what sort of person? Well, possibly, an angry or resentful person. And, well, that will be pretty obvious to people. Well, what if, say, you're somebody who wants to be very effective and successful? probably you're going to act in a very different way from somebody who's resigned to failure. And so this is very, very important. Know, A, that Florence is subject to pride and envy, which are the foundations of all vice and sin for Dante, which means that Florence is in about the worst possible state you can be in. And know that vice is the mental disposition on which sin, which is the specific sinful act, uh, is based. So a sin is a specific action. A vice is a mental disposition. What is being punished in the inferno are sins, actions, specific things that you did. What will be expiated in the purgatorio will be the much more difficult mental or spiritual dispositions. Much, much harder to change how someone thinks 
and sees, but to change simply what someone does. I want you to keep that in mind. All right, good. Moving on to circle four, Plutus. Now, circle four is the first circle where we have one sin split in two. The way to think about this is this. They are not different sins. They are two sides of the same bling, coin. Very good. They are the same sin manifested in differing ways. Ooh, tricky. And so, what do we run into first when we're getting to this circle? Well, we run into another monster guarding it, a monster who actually happens to be based on a god. His name is Plutus. Plutus is different from the god Pluto in the Greek mythology. Pluto, of course, is Hades, the god of Tartarus, the underworld of uh, the Romans and the Greeks. And Plu, or excuse me, that's Pluto. Plutus is the god of wealth, which is very interesting because you can see why they'd be conflated together because wealth, in terms of gold, where do you find that? You find that beneath the ground. Well, where do you find Tartarus for the ancient Greeks and Romans? Beneath the ground as well. Very good, very good. And in fact, uh, yeah, so it used to be the case even that uh, amongst Vikings, that they would actually, and Egyptians, that they would be buried or sent off to sail with their old uh, possessions. So the idea seemed to be that, you know, you, you put the, the thing that is of value into the ground and the person gets to go on to the next life with that. Though, apparently, we've become a little bit more sophisticated. Instead of just belongings, we take our actions with us. And actually, we don't take them with us. We leave them here uh, for others to learn from. Which is interesting. We'll talk a little bit about that. I know that's sort of a philosophical thing to say. In any case, we run into Plutus here. And he says something nonsensical, meaningless. Pape Satan, Pape Satan, Alepe. We technically can't translate that because it's technically not a language. The idea seems to be this. The reason that you sin in an incontinent way is you're not using your mind. You're being nonsensical. You're acting in a nonsensical, meaningless sort of way. In fact, you start to see what the contrapasso of the misers, or the avaricious, and the prodigal is. To live your life just for money, to spend it or to keep it, is a nonsensical way to live. Because you always need to make money for something. Or you always need to spend money for something. There's always a reason beyond simply having money. And in fact, there is a political system based on Plutus called Plutocracy, which is ruled by the wealthy, which is different from an aristocracy ruled by the best, and uh, an oligarchy ruled by the fuel. Or excuse me, the few, not the fuel. In any case, moving on. You don't need to write any of this because you already wrote it. Good. All right. Punishment. What is the punishment of those in circle four amongst the avaricious and the prodigal? Well, first I should say that uh, Plutus tries to stop Virgil and Dante. Virgil uh, basically says, we are... We are uh, we are moving forward with the will of God, and therefore we're going to go past you, just like we went past Charon, just like, or made us carry him on his ferry, just like we went past Cerberus, just like we're going to go past everybody that tries to get in our way, because we have supreme authority behind us. Uh, uh, Plutus appears to just like kind of fall away then, and so that was fairly easy to deal with. So we come upon a track now where we see a circle. And on that circle, we see one group of people, the avaricious, Moving their stones in a half circle. It's called a semicircle. Uh, from one edge to another. Always 180 degrees, never 360. You say, why can't they go full circle? Why can't they attain this full perspective? Yes? Because there's another group on the other side. Because there's another group on the other side. And so I'm going to start explaining this, and I think you're going to start to see the underlying symbol here. The avaricious, they move their stones always along one track. Always wanting to get the full picture but never getting there, because who do they run into, like we said? The prodigal. Well, the prodigal are always going along half the track, too. Why do they not make it to the other half? Because of the avaricious. And so they're constantly blaming each other. And so whenever they run into each other at the halfway point, which they never get past, on one edge of the circle, and then on the other, they start to fight. And they fight with words. And they fight with their fists. But the problem is this. Are each of them actually keeping... How do I want to put this? Is it the case that they are being kept from attaining a new perspective by each other or by themselves? And how do you know? So those sinners in this circle assume that it is the sinners of the other type. If you're avaricious, then those who are prodigal that are keeping you from attaining full perspective. 
Is it somebody outside yourself who kept you from attaining a fuller perspective on your own personal problems in this circle? The answer for every circle is what? No. It's always yourself, right? The reason they're there is their own choices. The reason they can't see past what they've already seen is their own choices and the fact that they are now denied the good of the what? Because they are dead. Intellect. The intellect. And so will their perspective ever change? No. So they know precisely as much as they ever did and they will never know more. And so I think that this is a profound symbol of only ever attaining a skewed and partial perspective without ever using the thing necessary to achieve a full perspective. So that you can come full circle. Do you see? Good. Good. And so the allegorical interpretation is, just as I said, they always retread the same tracks and blame their problems on others, and thus they never see that they are equally sinful. The prodigal and the avaricious. Not each other's problems, but they are themselves their problems. That they're equally afflicted by the same shared sin, so they can never come full circle or convert their gaze. Ah, one question for you. There were three arch sinners in Tartarus last year, in both the Aeneid and the Odyssey. One of them was renowned for forever, every day, pushing a rock, a boulder, up a hill, just to have it roll back down. Their punishment is clearly modeled off his, themselves moving weights, which are represented as boulders, Forever in one direction, just have to push them in another. Who was that arch sinner from last year? Do any of you recall? Yes? Yes, it was Sisyphus. Very good. Any of you remember the other two? One who had uh, fruits on a tree forever above him, and he was starving, and water up to his chin, which would retract when he tried to drink it, and he was parched. So thirsty. Yes? Tantalus, and that's where we get the verb to tantalize someone, like what you do with your cat. And you have like a little feather on a stick, and it's like, ram. And you're like, ha, ah, stupid cats. And it's like, hmm, perhaps, perhaps, but you're entertained by that. In any case, do any of you recall the name of the man, this is the one that I found is hardest for students to remember, who um, has forever his liver being ripped out by two vultures? Not Prometheus, who has one vulture, yes? Titius, very good, it was Titius, excellent, very good. All right, another image of these people. Looks like they're working pretty hard. Are they getting anywhere? No, and you know, when you get to physics, you'll learn that there is a difference between applying force to something and doing work. In order to do work, there actually has to be change. Is there any change here? So nobody's doing any what? Work. Very good. Very good. Here's another image from an illuminated manuscript. Something interesting to notice here is uh, you see a guy with a funny red hat. In the Catholic face, Faith, people who wear funny red, red robes and red hats, do you know what they are? They, we actually name a bird for them. Yes? Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's actually a professional baseball team from St. Louis. Yes? Cardinals. The Cardinals. They're called Cardinals. The guy with the funny white hat here is obviously a what, though? <laughs> this is a very funny hat. The Pope. Yeah. And so amongst these uh, avaricious and, mar or, and prodigal people, we find many clergymen. In fact, they're totally indistinct. They're considered totally indistinct at this point. So we don't actually get to talk to any of them, which I find very interesting. All right. Um, I have here a discourse on fortune, but I read it during the last class. You can listen to the, the lecture if you want to, if you want to see this. But I'm not going to read it to you because I, I'm actually, I, I don't think it's as useful as I thought it was. What I do want to show you, though, are three images of fortune. And I want you to see the gender that fortune is represented as. This is Fortuna, the goddess Fortuna, already given it away. And notice that thing in her left hand. It's, uh, what is that? Left hand, left hand, yes? It looks kind of like that, but I mean, mostly I'm just looking for the shape. It's a circle or a wheel. That's technically a spindle right there. Good. Uh, think of a... Uh, <laughs> Think of a game show that maybe you and your parents have seen before that's based on the notion of a circle of fortune. Yes? Wheel of fortune. Yes, very good. That comes 
from these medieval times. They had this notion of the rota fortunae. Rota, where we get rotary from, means circle. Fortunae obviously means fortune. Wheel of fortune. Notice that fortune is often represented as a woman. This seems to be based on the idea that uh, nature is feminine and also based on Agamemnon's idea that uh, nature as a woman is in some way inconstant or changeable. The idea that is put forward here in this quote is that do you ever, and look at these people on this wheel, does it look like they know what's about to happen to them? No. And part of the idea here is that you never know what's going to happen to you. And so, the world is a very dangerous and scary place. You might as well use your what in it? Your mind, your intellect. Because what else do you have to deal with when things all change in an instant? And if you were to say, Mr. Schmidt, how do things change? I would say, some things change gradually. Like mountains, which are eroding. But some things, like you, change immediately at times. Car crashes. People enter your life. You change from a student to no longer a student. These things can be very quick. Very quick. And so Dante is here cautioning you to use your head. Because in order to deal with how fast this world moves, it's the only thing you can use to do it. All right. That's all I wanted to say about that. Let's go to Canto 7 and 8. Talk about wrath and sullenness. All right. Dante and Virgil approach a bank. At that bank is a marsh. It's described as a marsh because it's sort of dirty and unclean and gross. So it's not like close or, or pure or reflected. Or it's not like pure uh, crystalline water. There we go. At this river, apparently this marsh, called the Stygian Marsh, is a river, the River Styx, the river that we've been looking for because we've read the Aeneid and the Odyssey together. Well, in this river are sinners. Sinners of the fifth circle. They are inside the River Styx. There are sinners on the top of the water, fighting and thrashing about because they're very angry with each other, as well as sinners beneath the water who are boiling up, who are apparently boiling with rage or screaming into the water uh, imp impotently. In order to get across this river, we can't swim with all these sinners. We don't want to try and go through that. We need a new ferryman. Who is that new ferryman? Well, his name is Phlegias. And he comes, and he says, Woe to you, sinners. And Virgil says, uh, you, you have to carry us from here to there, and then we'll get past you. Don't worry about us. And Phlegias does as he's told, just like every Greco-Roman creature that we run into. Now, on the way through the water, however, something fairly remarkable happens. One of the sinners, who recognizes the speech of Dante as being Tuscan in dialect, is a Florentine. His name is Filippo Argenti. He tries to board the ship. And, well, actually, Virgil takes an oar <laughs> and knocks him off and says, stay off here with the other dogs. And has, has disdain for him. And so you might ask, or, and well, Dante actually says, sort of thank you afterwards. Virgil like, kisses him on the face and says, you know, it's a very Italian thing. It's like an uncle or an aunt doing that to you and says, Good for you for feeling appropriate disdain. Our question then becomes, what? The one guy who's in the water is angry. But isn't Virgil and isn't Dante feeling anger too? Is there a difference between the anger that Virgil and Dante feel and the sinner's anger? What do you think? Yeah. Why do you think, yeah? I'll, I'll help. I'll help. The people who are angry within the water were angry without moderation, and possibly for no reason, or poor reasons. Dante and Virgil are justly angry. Now there's a belief in the ancient and medieval world that when somebody does something which is actually immoral or wrong or bad, that you are filled with anger or contempt or disdain for them. You might even be disgusted by their actions. And that's certainly appropriate so that you can help uh, work them back towards a, a, a more neutral state. Dante and Virgil here are angry because Filippo Argenti has done something to earn their anger. And thus when they feel angry, it is a noble or an appropriate anger. 
So you see here that Dante is not just saying any old angry person goes down into the inferno. It's angry people that become violent, animal-like, give in to their anger, lose control. There's someone who can stay controlled and be like, very bad. There's something different about that person. They're exercising restraint. Which is important because I think you'll notice that circle 5 and circle 7 are very similar. Circle 5, people who are angry and violently lashing out at each other. Circle 7, people who are violent. You're usually violent because you're feeling what? Angry. Alright. And that is that for today. Lecture 6, students. On Canto 6 to 10, Upper Hell, Part 1. Really, it's Upper Hell, Part 2. We're going to review gluttony very quickly. We're going to consider Plutus and fortune. I'll read a little bit of a quote for you. We're going to see the angry for the first time as well as the sullen. Then we're going to reach this and hopefully meet the heretics. Probably we're not going to have time to meet the heretics today. All right, Canto 6. Remember, Canto 6 is where Circle 3 is. Circle 3 is the sin, where the sin of gluttony is punished. Remember the word gluttony comes from the Greek word glosso, which is where we get the word glossary from, which means tongue. So it's a sin of using the tongue in an inappropriate way. That means to taste food without thinking about the substance of food, or to eat excessively, to drink excessively, missing the meat. So you get the nice, nice taste, but you, ex you experience very poor effects on your body, potentially indigestion, but in the case of Shiako, he becomes like a pig, which means that he becomes rather corpulent or amorphous. That means uh, rather large as a person. In any case, we're going to talk a little bit about Siako today, see something he has to say, talk a little bit about Florentine politics as well. Here's a nice picture of Cerberus. Recall that that is the three-headed dog of Hades that is now appropriated here into Dante's Inferno, and in fact he is described as the, uh, I believe, the, the Gran Verma. He is the great worm. The idea being that he's all belly like a worm. In any case, here's William Blake's representation of Cerberus. I thought that was rather fantastic. Big thing is that it's got three heads, and so in some way it's a reference to the Trinity, and in some way he is a corruption of the Trinity. Something that rather than giving, 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 is taking, taking, taking. Consuming, consuming, consuming. And so something to keep in mind while looking at this inferno is look for infernal trinities. Look for triples that are supposed to reference the medieval Catholic Christian God, I think you'll find that you'll see, you'll be quite rewarded if you look for these sorts of things. In any case, the gluttons. These are the centers of excess, as you know. They eat and drink too much. Cerberus is there. You don't need to write this. We've written this before. And just as in life, they were consumed by their desire for food and drink, so are they consumed in death. All right, this is where we're starting. Gluttony explored. Dante and Virgil, just to give you some idea of what the landscape is like, in this, uh, in this circle, is this, and this is for you to write, is that Dante and Virgil are literally stepping on sinners who are stuck in the mud while hail and rain strikes them while they listen to the sinners groan. So they're trying to get through this circle. They have to step on actual sinners. They're everywhere around there, and they're groaning, and they're complaining. There will be a similar sort of situation down in Circle 9 when we reach the frozen uh, river of Cocytus, the fourth river of hell, where um, Dante and Virgil will have to cross some faces that are stuck just on the top of the mud. It would be rather creepy. In fact, if you ever watch a movie with Robin Williams called What Dreams May Come, they do a pretty good job of showing Cocytus there, but probably you need to wait until, I don't know if it's R or PG-13, but probably you need to wait until you're older to watch it. In any case... Cerberus is an interesting character here because not only is that a reference backwards in time towards uh, the Hades or the Dis that is involved in Virgil's Aeneid Book 6, but it's also a reference forward in time. If you've ever read or seen Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone called the Philosopher's Stone in England, but changed the Sorcerer's Stone because the idea was that Americans were too uneducated to know what a Philosopher's Stone is, uh, which is the truth, you'll notice there that there is a guard dog of a secret corridor where death must be faced. That dog's name is Fluffy. It also has three heads. It is clearly based on Cerberus. Cerberus is an idea that has existed now for several thousand years. And so, well worth knowing yourselves. So, the main center that we run into down in the Inferno, uh, Circle 3, Canto 6, is Shiako. Recall that Shiako means pig or hog in medieval 
Italian, though we were let know that there are a couple more words like maiale as well as porco. I think there's even another word for pig. In fact, we have many words for pigs too. Pig, swine, hog, pork, all sorts of things. In any case, this Shiako brings up something that he is full of, not just food, of course, but memory. And he brings up the division in Florence that we're going to see over and over again in not only the Inferno, but also the Purgatorio. The division between the Guelphs and the Ghibellines. And remember that Dante was himself a Guelph, and that the Guelphs would further subdivide into white Guelphs and black Guelphs. Very similar to how Christianity split into the Eastern Church and the Western Church, and then the Western Church further subdivided into Catholics and Protestants. And so, division happens amongst people always. It's one of those great facts of life. In any case, this is the major division in Florence at the time of Dante, and in the recent past were major struggles, uh, violent struggles, in Florence between the Guelphs and the Ghibellines. In particular, 1248 and 1260, the, ba uh, the battle technically at Monteperti, uh, where both times the Ghibellines defeated the Guelphs. We'll talk about that when we get to Farinata amongst the heretics. All right. Now, Dante meets Chiaco, and he's still new to the Inferno here, and he says, Hey, are these leading citizens from Florence? Uh, do you know where they are? They're great people. And Chiaco says, Well... The thing about those people you call great is they're actually amongst the blackest souls in hell. And so you're starting to see the perception Dante has of his own people. Does he simply think that the Florentines are the greatest and the best? Or is he highly critical of his own countrymen? What do we think? Yes. Highly critical. Highly critical. And when somebody, uh, when an author is highly critical of his own people, does that increase your trust in his narrative or decrease your trust? Yes? Increase. Why would it increase your trust in his narrative, potentially? Because he's talking about the failures of his people and why they haven't done as well. Right, he's talking about the failures of his people rather than talking about their successes. What is, what is it uh, that we call a piece of art or literature that only focuses on the good parts of a person or people, usually with political ends? Think of a political ad, even, yes? It's biased. It is biased, but there's a very particular word that we brand such art with. It is called propaganda. Propaganda. Because the point of art is to show something true. The point of propaganda is to assert that you are right. Those two do not always go hand in hand. In any case, let's talk about, very quickly, these people. I just want you to write their names and where they are very quickly. Here are the four people we are going to see during the course of the Inferno that Dante apparently thinks were great men, and yet still ended up in his Inferno. Well, we're going to see uh, Farinata very soon in Circle 10. He's actually going to be in a flaming tomb right next to uh, the guy whose daughter, or the guy whose son his daughter married, named Cavalcanti de Cavalcanti, and the son-in-law of his is named Guido Cavalcanti, uh, the best friend of Dante. And I might actually share with you a very sad, a very sad, a very sad poem that Dante wrote about Guido when they were young. It was home wishing that they could be taken off to a land where they would never grow up because they love each other so much. What's sad about that is that eventually Dante, when he becomes Podesta, he will banish his friend Guido, his best friend, after they've grown apart, and Guido will die of malaria that very same year. And so the poem will say, I wish things would never change so we would never grow apart, and then of course what ends up happening in their lives, things change and they grow apart. It's very sad. Uh, but part of life. And so know that Farinata Deli Uberti is going to show up in Inferno 10. We will get to just before him today, most likely. Then, we're going to meet two guys amongst the Sodomites. They're going to run in a circle right below Dante. It's actually going to be three people running in a circle. Again, one of those false uh, trinities, one of those infernal trinities. Uh, this guy's name is Tigayo Aldebrandi, and the second guy is Jacopo Rusticucci. We're going to see them in Inferno 16. Uh, in, amongst the violence against God, art, and nature. And then the last soul we'll see very deep down in the Inferno will be named Mosca in Canto 28, amongst the suburbs of Discord, where you're going to see uh, uh, Muhammad with his face cut in half and also <laughs> Ali with his stomach cut in half. And uh, also a guy named Bertrand de Born who's going to carry around his own head like the headless horseman. In any case, moving forward, moving forward. All right. 
Here I just wanted to show you that remember there are four ways to read Dante's The Divine Comedy. There's the literal way, which is Dante's going through hell, purgatory, and heaven. It's very straightforward. It's the narrative way. That's the way that I expect you all to be able to read always. But then, there are three other ways to read. The allegorical way, which we'll touch on fairly often, which is, what does all of this mean? The anagogical way, which Dante explicitly says is the way to liberate one's soul from slavery unto freedom. We're not going to talk about that a lot, but I will suggest one way to interpret this, uh, just to show you how it works. And, of course, there is the moral way to read as well. I just want to show you that when looking at the Divine Comedy itself, you can look through all four of these lenses. And so here's one of the interpretations. The allegorical reading of memory by Shiaka. The Divine Comedy is itself a collective storehouse, a so-called encyclopedia of ideas both bad in the Inferno, transitionally good in the Purgatorio, and internally good in the Paradiso. It's almost like memory is important because that's where we keep all the bad things and good things that have ever happened. So when you learn the memory of your people, you can do what? Choose between what's good and bad with actual knowledge. You might think that that's the whole purpose of school. An anagogical reading of memory is to fall into the traps of these sins is to enter one's soul into eternal bondage. This is the end game for these souls. What they wanted, they got. So that's a very dark way to read the Inferno, that these souls didn't end up where they didn't want to be. They ended up exactly where they always wanted to be. This is just what it looks like when you look at the end of such a terrible sin or vice. And I will, just, I will give you the difference between sin and vice today. A moral reading is, do not be led to perdition, or off the way of moderation by attraction to, in this case, food. This is an animal trait, in that it fails to account for time and human functionality. In fact, something interesting about that, you might say, how do you know it's an animal, just eat as much as you can? Mr. Schmidt will say, we know for a fact that if a wolf alone takes down a deer, it can eat up to 25 pounds from it. Now, you're like, how much is 25 pounds? I'd say, it's about 100 times more than you eat in a usual meal. 100 times. You say, based on what? I say, a quarter pound burger. That's the traditional size of a burger. A quarter pound. What's quarter times four? And then times 25. That's 100 times more. And so, something interesting. Well, we're thinking about it. In any case, I just wanted to show you that. All right. You don't need to write this, but I do need you to know this. Now, something we learn about Florence is that it is subject to three terrible sins. Actually, write these terrible sins down. Superbia. That's the Latin, or the Italian in this case, for to be proud. They are proud. Invidia. That means envy. They are envious. And avarizia. That means that they are greedy. They're greedy envious, and proud. Something interesting you'll notice about the Inferno itself is that there is no circle for envy. There is no circle for pride. Though there are circles for envy and pride as the foundation of the mountain of purgatory. Why? Well, these are the three spark sparks that have inflamed the hearts of the Florentines against each other. Dante is demonstrating the relation of vice to sin. Oh, apparently they're different. While sin is the specific... Ah, yes, I do want you to write this. While sin is the specific act that has been committed, vice is the disposition of the soul, remember Aristotle's corruptions, that inclines it towards sinful action. So apparently a vice is sort of a mental attitude you have that leads to sinful actions. I'll repeat that one time. A vice seems to be a mental disposition or a disposition of soul for Aristotle that leads to specific actions. Sinful acts. So what you are punished for in the inferno is your sin, how you acted. But what you must expiate, what you must fix in the purgatorio is your vice. And so, and this is a difficult question, especially because you're writing, but I'm still going to ask it and see if anybody can answer it. When one gets to the purgatorio rather than the inferno, what must one fix first? One's mind or one's actions? Mind. Why do you say mind? Because. Why do you say one has to get one's head straight? One needs to get moving in the right direction. Because once you like, like decide what you want, you go towards it. That seems exactly right. 
maybe you've, maybe you've had an attitude adjustment with a parent, teacher, or coach at some point. Does that start to make sense to you? That when you are faced in the right direction, which is a metaphor, you tend to walk in the right direction. In fact, we'll see people that are punished uh, in the bottom levels of the inferno who are faced literally in the wrong direction. They are literally moving the wrong direction. Those will be the people who claim to be able to see the future, but apparently could not see their own future. All right, good. So here Dante requires us to consider this distinction, the distinction between sin, which is the specific, specific sinful act that has been committed, and the underlying vice, which is the disposition of soul that inclines to sin. Again, we see an infernal trinity, Florentines having problems leading towards division because they are proud, envious, and avaricious. Um, when we get to purgatory, you will see that pride and envy, according to Dante, and sort of the medieval belief was that those were the absolute worst possible vices to have because they lead to more vices. Well, that makes sense. That makes sense. All right, moving on. Circle four, Plutus. Now, remember what he says immediately to Dante upon Dante and Virgil approaching him. Pape Satan, Pape Satan, Alepe. It's nonsense. It doesn't make sense. Well, that's part of the contrapasso of this circle. Those who pursue money simply to have more money, or those who spend money simply to spend money, also spend without sense, spend without reason. And so there seems to be a lack of mm, awareness of the purpose or the symbolic purpose of money in this circle. People seem to just do something because it feels good rather than seeing the consequences of doing it. You're seeing that that seems to be what is common throughout all the sense of incontinence. And so remember that this ancient god Plutus is different from the ancient god Pluto. Pluto, god of the dead. Plutus, god of wealth. A system of politics based on Plutus or wealth is called a plutocracy, which is rule by the wealthy. I don't know if you've ever learned about that. You've probably heard of an oligarchy, which is ruled by the few. Aristocracy, which is ruled by the best, which is always few. Um, if you just think about it. And then, of course, there's a plutocracy as well. Okay, good. Note also that this is yet another pagan creature or god who tries to stop the progress, the moral progress, as well as the physical progress of Dante the Pilgrim and Virgil through the underworld. And yet again, Virgil has a trump card. This is willed by the divine, the medieval Catholic Christian god, not some Greco-Roman pagan god. Therefore, your power is Nil. And we will soon talk about why it is the case that Dante includes these Greco-Roman beings in his underworld. There seems to be, uh, uh, he seems to be trying to go beyond what they provided. I'll say more about that soon. In any case, the two conjoined sins of Circle 4 are avarice and prodigality. Avarice means to be greedy. To be prodigal means to be overly liberal or free in one's spending. That's all I really need to say here. That's a nice slide. That's a nice slide. In any case, what is the punishment, therefore, of this circle? Well, each and every one of the souls is pushing a boulder in a semicircle along a certain track that never changes. The avarice, or the avaricious, Greedy, go along one track, one way, and then another. Always going in the same 180 degree pattern. Well, the liberal or prodigal people also go in a semicircle. And when they meet at the halfway point on one end and then the other, they clash both with words as well as fists because they think they hate each other because they think they're different. Why is that a mistake? Because they're both subject to the same sin, just in a different way. We have an expression for this. There are two parts of the same, or two sides of the same coin. Exactly right. So, even though they are directing their ire, their anger at each other, really, the source of their problems are each other, or themselves. Exactly so. And so there's even more to this punishment, actually. Since they're only ever moving in a semicircle, they never go around the entire circle. They never come full circle. They never achieve a full perspective of what it is they're being punished for. 
And so forever, they're just being punished, so far as they think, without reason. <laughs> and yet, is it without reason? No. No, not at all. Not at all. So an allegorical way to interpret this is that these souls always retread the exact same tracks. And then they blame their problems on others and never see that they are all equally sinful and equally afflicted by their shared sin. And so, I think that's really sad, because I think that's also a metaphor for how, uh, say, uh, a typical person might live his or her life, encounter the same problem over and over and over, and then get resentful and think, why is the world made in this way? And it's like, well, the thing about you as a human is you can use your head, and can you change your behavior in order to get different outcomes in the future? Yes. And that's exactly what these souls will never, ever do. Very sad. Very sad. Also, ah, yes, a question that I was interested in. Since they're always pushing heavy rocks, and it's useless because they never get anywhere, there were three arch sinners you met in Hades, also called Tartarus, last year in both uh, the Iliad, or excuse me, both the Odyssey and the Aeneid. Do you remember the one who forever pushes a rock up a mountain? just to have it roll back down and to have to do it again? Yes? I, I was thinking Hector. Not Hector, not Hector. Hector Hector is not one of these arch centers. His name is Sisyphus. And you should remember that. There's a very famous French philosopher who wrote a very famous work in the 20th century called The Myth of Sisyphus. He makes the claim that's sort of the life of all humans. Every day you have to get up, do a bunch of work, then fall asleep, do it again. It makes a lot of sense. It makes a lot of sense. All right, let's move on now from the avaricious and the prodigal. This is an illumination from an illuminated manuscript. Um, ah, yes. Let's move to Virgil's discourse on fortune. I want you all to pay very close attention to what Virgil has to say here. Because fortune for Dante is often represented as a woman at a wheel. In fact, let me show you three pieces of art that all have her as a woman on a wheel. It's almost like things happen by chance, and you can't stop them from happening. In fact, Aristotle says that much earlier, and I would say that we all agree with that. Things happen by chance in life. So let's see what Virgil has to say. Oh, unenlightened creatures, how deep the ignorance that hampers you. I want you to digest my word on this. Funny that he uses a metaphor of digestion here amongst, uh, right after gluttony. Who made the heavens and who gave them gods was he whose wisdom transcends everything that every part may shine unto the other. So Virgil says, the world is made perfectly. Very interesting thing is that he's talking about whom when he says the world is made perfectly? God the Father, the Christian God. But he was a pagan, so who did he not know during his life? I know, so one of my questions here is, how does Virgil know this? He never read any text about this during his life. In any case... He had the light apportioned equally similarly for worldly splendors. He ordained a general minister and guide. This is the son he's talking about. To shift from time to time those empty goods from nation unto nation. Oh, excuse me, he's talking about fortune now. Clan to clan in ways that human reason can't prevent. He says things happen to people, to nations, to places, and they can't be prevented. And that happens. That's kind of uh, scary. Just so one people rules, one languishes, Obeying the decision she has given, which, like a serpent in the grass, is hidden. Does it, who knows their fortune? Answer? No one. Right. Exactly. <laughs> and the question I might ask you at some point is, would you even want to know your fortune? Often I ask that in the form of, would you like to know exactly when and how you die? I, yeah, a lot of people say no. A lot of people say no. And so I think that's very interesting. In any case, your knowledge cannot stand against her force. And she foresees and judges and maintains her kingdom as the other gods do theirs. The changes that she brings are without respite. It is necessity that makes her swift. And for this reason, men often or change state so often. She is the one so frequently maligned, even by those who should give praise to her. They praise her wrongfully with words of scorn. But she is blessed and does not hear these things. For with other primal beings, happy, she turns her spear and glories in her bliss. And this is an image of so-called rota fortunae. That's the Latin way of saying wheel of fate. We do, of course, have a, uh, uh, if you've already noticed, we do have a game show based on the idea of fortune. Anybody know what it's called? You actually spin a wheel. Yes? 
Wheel of Fortune. You see how vulgar that game show is using this concept? In any case, in any case, yes, this idea too is uh, hundreds and hundreds of years old, actually over a thousand years old, because Boethius was one of the first people to really put this in the print, and he did that before 1000 AD. All right, I just wanted y'all to know a little bit about what Virgil says about fortune. Apparently, bad things can happen to you, and it's not always your fault. So I don't want you to think that that's what Dante or Virgil thinks. He thinks a lot of things you could probably prevent, but can you prevent everything? No, certainly not. Certainly not. Bad things happen. All right, so the questions I have here, or the notes I wanted you to take from this uh, disquisition on fortune is this. A, how does Virgil know about God? He is a pre-Christian pagan, and part of the reason that he's down in limbo is that he did not know the Christian faith. So how does he know so much about God? Perhaps he doesn't. Perhaps he only knows about fortune and is guessing about the divine who made all things. I don't know. Something to note about fortune is that it comes and goes and no one can explain it, master it, or knows the cause of it. It seems to be just a part of life that cannot be dealt with. You say, Mr. Schmidt, is that still true, even though we have such... Uh, incredible power, scientifically speaking. I would say, absolutely. Things still happen every single day that we can't explain. In fact, if there were no such thing as fortune, we would not have a thing called the stock market, which changes uh, and, and goes up and down every day, and nobody has figured it out yet. It's the most, com you know, it is the most com one of the most complex things that exists. Uh, you should know the stock market is the sum total of the consumer decisions made by every human on the planet. And so that's why it's so complicated and nobody understands it. In any case, there are some good examples of fortune hitting. Fortune, according to Virgil, destroys peoples and people. Well, which nations have come to be and passed away before the time of Dante, so far as he knows? Well, there were the Egyptians. And um, just as far removed as we are from Cleopatra and Caesar, so were the Egyptians from the, or so were the Romans from the people who made the pyramids. And so even during Roman times, 2,000 years ago, the Egyptians were considered ancient. They probably thought they would never disappear. And there is still an Egypt, but it is not a great empire in the same way that the ancient Egyptian empire was. B, the Greeks. Well, there were the Athenians and the Spartans, and they came from the Mycenaeans and the Minoans, and then they were conquered by Alexander the Great, who was a Hellenistic ruler, and then, well, there were none of them, because they were defeated later by the Romans. Well, the Romans, in the 5th century, they were defeated by the German barbarians, the Goths, as it were. Where are they? They're gone. Fortunes rise, and fortunes what, students? They fall. Right. And in fact, notice the double entendre. In fact, we say that you go out to make your fortune, and that you have made a fortune. And it lets you know just how uh, 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 fragile that relationship is, because what is it that we know about a fortune, even if you have it in your hand? Yes. It's not always right. And it won't always, and it will never last. And it will not last. All right, Canto 7 and 8, let's talk about Circle 5. Circle 5, like Circle 4, is split into two, two aspects of the same sin. Just as in Circle 4, we had those who were greedy or money-grubbing, as well as those who were prodigal and money-spending, we have here those who are wrathful and extroverted in their anger. They express their anger by punching each other and hitting each other at the top of the Stygian Marsh, which is the second river of the Inferno called Styx. They're also the sullen, who beneath the waters are bubbling upwards. And why is that? Well, it seems that they're still burning with rage and the bubbles are coming up, or that they're screaming silently in rage and uh, that the bubbles are coming up from them. My goodness, it's almost like those who express their anger outside are just as bad as those who resentfully and sulkily keep their anger inside. Probably because they explode at some point. So, what I really need you to notice here is that we hit our second river in the Inferno. We know the first one, Acheron. We know the first ferryman, Charon. Well, here we run into a second river. If there's a river blocking our way, we need a what to take us across it? We need a fairy, which means we need an infernal ferryman. Do you think it will be the same person as the person who was on the river uh, Acheron, which was in a different location? No, obviously not. It's got to be a different ferryman. And so, let's take a look at this. Horrifying. 
Alright, fine. Let's go stop the ray. Ah, there's Plagias. Uh, and there is also Filippo Argenti. A wrathful. Oh my goodness. Hmm. Alright. Dante and Virgil approach the bank. At the bank, a ferry approaches them. On the second river of hell, the river of sticks, sometimes called the river of hate, sometimes called the Stygian Marsh, because it's, it's, uh, it's, it's like a marsh. It's hard to see through. It's not clear water. It's dirty. The sin here is divided in two, as I said, the angry striking each other on the top of the Stygian Marsh, the sullen boiling below with resentful thoughts. Phlegias is the ferryman. He approaches, and he is commanded by Virgil. Again, yet another Greco-Roman figure who attempts to stop the passing of Dante the Pilgrim as well as Virgil and fails to stop them because the authority that carries Virgil and Dante forward is higher than the authority that they are imbued with because they are imbued with the authority of the medieval Catholic Christian God. Well, after Dante gets onto the ferry with Virgil and Phlegias is taking them across and he's looking down and seeing all these these people fighting on the waves, one of the sinners tries to jump up on the boat. His name is Filippo Argenti. He is a Florentine. And in fact, I used to think that he actually managed to kiss Dante, but that's not what happens. While he's trying to grab the boat, Virgil actually knocks him off with an oar, shoes him away, and says, get off with the other dogs. Uh, and then Virgil actually kisses Dante and says, the disdain you feel, the contempt you feel, for this terrible soul, is actually very much appropriate. And then Dante says, I really want to see him get hit. Will the other souls start punching him? And uh, the answer is no, they actually start biting him and ripping him apart because of that. Yeah, I know, I know, it's an ugly place down there. It's an ugly, 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 ugly place. They watch Filippo get mauled by teeth. In fact, let's, uh, let's see it. And this will be where we end today. You've done very good. This is a lot of material. You will definitely have a bell work assignment based on this tomorrow. All right, bowstring has not thrust from itself an arrow. I want you to notice bowstring and arrow metaphors during the course of this. You're going to see a lot of them in the Paradiso. That ever rushed as swiftly through the air as did the little bark that at that moment I saw as it skimmed towards us on the water. A solitary boatman at its helm. I heard him howl. Now you are caught, foul soul. Oh, Phlegias, Phlegias, such a shout is useless this time. My master said, we're yours no longer than it will take to cross the mud muddy sluice. And just as one who hears some great deception was done to him, and then resents it, so was Phlegias when he had his store, or when he had to store his anger. And so he himself chose the uh, sin of this particular circle. And while we stared across the, or steered across the stagnant channel, stagnant because it never changes, hopeless place as it were, before me stood a sinner, thick with mud, saying, Who are you? Come before your time. And I to him, I've come, but I don't stay. But who are you, who have become so ugly? He answered, You can see I'm one who weeps. And I to him, in weeping and in grieving, accursed spirit, may you long remain. Though you're disguised by filth, I know your name. Then he stretched both his hands out toward the boat, at which my master quickly shoved him back, saying, Be off there with the other dogs. My goodness, worthy of such wrath, he must have been a terrible person. Ooh. That done, he threw his arms around my neck, this is Virgil to Dante, and kissed my face and said, Indignant soul, blessed is she who bore you in her womb. Within this world he was presumptuous. There is no good to gild his memory, and so his shade down here is hot with fury. How many up there now count themselves great kings? Will wallow here... Pigs and slime, leaving behind foul memories of their crimes. And I, O oh Master, am very eager to see that spirit souse with this broth before we've made our way across the lake. And so he will be Dante and Virgil, thus approach the gate of this. Tomorrow, or excuse me, Thursday, we will make it into lower hell. Good work today.